Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Tevedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati and in this particular course, we are discussing about the different aspects of the molecular biology. So, so far what we have discussed, we have discussed about the basic structures of the uh, cell. So, we have discussed about the prokaryotic structure and the eukaryotic structures. Following to that, we have also discussed about the uh, different types of biomolecules, we discuss about the different types of cellular activities and in the previous lecture, we have discussed about the uh, central dogma of molecular biology and we have also discussed about the uh, different components which are be a part of the central dogma of molecular biology. So, we have discussed about the replication in detail about uh, in the previous module and we have discussed about the replication in the prokaryotes and the replication in eukaryotes and then we also discuss about how the replication is helping the cell to recover from the different types of cellular damages or the DNA damages actually. In the current module, we are discussing about the another, another important aspect related to the central dogma of molecular biology and that is the transcription. So, if you recall in the previous few lectures, we have discussed about the, uh, the transcription in eukary uh, prokaryotes followed by the transcription in eukaryotes and in the previous lecture, we have discussed about the uh, how the post transcriptional modification is happening in the different types of RNA species what is going to be produced from the DNA and then how these uh, modifications are enabling these RNA species to work optimally for the protein production. Now, if you see the central dogma of molecular biology, what you see is that the ultimate goal of the central dogma of molecular biology is that it is want to produce a protein or I will say protein or the enzyme actually, right. And these proteins or the enzymes are actually going to participate into the different types of the metabolic reactions. Uh, for example, when we are discussing about the carbohydrate metabolism in the eukaryotic cells, uh, we discussed that the carbohydrates are actually uh, as soon as the glucose enter into the cell, right, it get phosphorylated by the hexokinase followed by the phosphorylation by the uh, different types of uh, followed by the uh, glucose 6 phosphate and other kinds of molecules and ultimately it is going to channelize that particular glucose molecule into the glycolysis. So, if the glucose, if you see about the glucose metabolism, glucose will enter and then it is actually going to be processed by the different types of enzyme to produce the uh, pyruvic acid, right. and these cascades of the reactions are going to be called as the glycolysis which occurs within the cytosol and uh, uh, pyruvic acid then will enter into the Krebs cycle and ultimately it is actually going to produce the different amount of energy uh, and it is also going to produce the different types of intermediates which are actually going to be utilized for the different types of synthesis. So, Krebs cycle is going to provide the raw material for the synthesis of the different types of amino acids. Uh, Krebs cycle is going to provide the raw material to synthesize the hemin, uh, which is a very, very important component for the uh, blood synthesis, right? Or in general, I will say hemoglobin synthesis. And then Krebs cycle is also important for the synthesis of the fat and as well as the nucleic acid. So, all these components are important because, uh, because they are actually going to be required for running the different types of the life related activities. Now, imagine that when the glucose level is down, right, or there is no supply of glucose. For example, the glucose from the glucose from where the glucose will come, the glucose will come from the food and as well as the glucose will enter into the cell, it will go through with these kind of reactions. But if there will be uh, excess of fat, then these reactions will go in this direction, right? And these will go in this direction and there will be less utilization of glucose. And if there will be less utilization of glucose, the enzymes which are being 
present within the glycolysis are going to be down regulated because there is only when mechanism uh, there are several mechanism what we have discussed when we were talking about the glycolysis or the uh, Krebs cycle how the Krebs cycle and the glycolysis is being regulated. But apart from the uh, feedback mechanism or allosteric regulations there is a also another level of regulation is that you are going to have the regulation at the level of the protein synthesis which means you are actually going to make the availability of these enzymes or the protein at uh, lower level or the higher level and depending upon the, the amount of these proteins or the enzyme the, that particular type of activity is actually either will go up or will go down actually. So, uh, these kind of events are more uh, uh, relevant when you are talking about the bacterial system because the bacterial system is going to have the polycystronic uh, you know the uh, transcriptional unit right compared to that eukaryotic system has the monocystronic uh, transcriptional unit. So, when you have a polycystronic uh, transcriptional unit this means you are going to have the different types of uh, enzymes uh, being produced simultaneously from the single transcript and in that case all the protein synthesis of all these enzymes are actually going to be under tight regulation or tight control so that you will be able to have the complete uh, control over the different types of events such as glycolysis, Krebs cycle and all other kinds of thing right. Although the Krebs cycle is not present in the, in the bacterial uh, system or the prokaryotic system, but for the sake of examples there are could be say many more other kinds of pathways for example, the you are going to have the uh, fatty acid synthesis pathway and you are going to have the other kinds of pathways like amino acid biosynthesis pathway and also on. So, all these pathways require a very tight control and one of the mechanism where uh, through which the bacteria is actually bringing the control is by uh, up regulating and down regulating the amount of protein what it actually going to synthesize. And this is all been achieved by uh, putting these enzymes or putting these genes or putting the transcriptional unit under a complete control uh, mechanisms right and all these uh, are being a part of the operon which means a system which actually is going to operate or going to regulate the transcription of these particular transcription followed by the synthesis of these proteins. Uh, so, a typical bacterial cell contains several thousand genes, some genes carry out the universal task and are constantly active these are called as the housekeeping genes. For example, the housekeeping genes include those that facilitate the synthesis of the protein and the ribosomal RNA. The majority of the genes however, only become active when their byproducts are needed. Such genes should not be expressed constitutively because the energy could be could be used for more productive task. So, what is mean by the constitutively means that it is actually going to be expressed uh, throughout the life cycle it is not going to be induced right. So, there you can actually have the two different two modes of the expression one is called as the constitutive the other one is called as the induced. So, induced means in case you have some action some kind of thing right for example, when you stand in the sun. Uh, you are going to have the sweating that so that sweating reactions are induced reaction because they are being induced by the sunlight ok. Whereas, you are going to have the constitutive reactions constitutive reactions means you are going to have the uh, irrespective of whether you are in sun or light or whatever you are going to have that. For example, uh, the uh, running of our heartbeat right. So, our heartbeat is going to be constitutive reactions. So, such gene uh, expression is controlled. So, the induced gene expression contr is controlled. So, their products are only produced when they are required in accordance with the need of the cell. The phase at which the gene expression can be controlled are numerous. So, in prokaryotes, the most common step at which the regulation of gene expression occur is the transcriptional initiation, right. You remember that uh, we have said that in the prokaryotes the transcription and the translation go together, right. So, there is no regulation at the translational uh, level in the in the case of prokaryotes. As soon as the RNA is being produced, 
uh, it is being present in the cytosol right so and it is actually going to be taken up by the translational machinery and the there will be a synthesis of the protein and what you can actually control is the initiation part right as if you do not allow the RNA polymerase to go and bind to the promoter and sit uh, and start the transcription then it is actually going to be controlled. So, it is energetically the most efficient step to regulate the gene expression. The transcriptional regulation occur in step after initiation specifically during elongation and termination. Prokaryotic transcriptional regulation is accomplished by the gene regulating protein that bind with the regulatory sequence near the transcription start site of the transcriptional unit. Gene regulatory protein, the product of gene regulatory protein are of two types they can be activators and they can be repressor. So, gene regulatory proteins or the gene regulatory uh, components are actually going to be the regulatory units which are going to regulate the efficiency of the RNA polymerase to go and sit onto the uh, transcriptional initiation site and that is how they are actually going to control the transcription. These gene regulatory proteins or the protein uh, gene products could be activated so that actually going to activate so they can actually be able to facilitate the RNA polymerase to go and bind to the initiation site or they could be repressor so that it they are actually going to block. So, activator means they are actually going to activate repressor which means they are actually going to block or they are going to inhibit the process. In the absence of both activator and repressor, transcription carried out by RNA polymerase is called as the basal level of transcription. The, the binding of a repressor decreases the transcription less than the basal level. So, repressor is inhibitor, right? So, it is going to inhibit, whereas the binding of an activator increases the transcription, which is the above the basal level. If both the row, both the repressor and activators are present and functional, the action of the repressor typically overtake over that the transcription. The basic concept of how gene regulation occur at a transcriptional unit in, in bacteria are provided by the classical model called the operon model. This is formulated by the Jacobson Monet in the 1961. So, how these repressor and the activators are regulating the gene expression uh, profiling and how they are actually regulating the transcriptional uh, activities within the bacteria is being uh, provided by a classical models and these models are called as the operon model and these models are hypothesized and formulated by the Jacob and Monet in the year of 1961. So, the question comes what is operon right. So, operon uh, is a set of genes. So, operon is a genetic regulatory system mostly seen in the prokaryotes and the bacteriophage in which a group of structural genes are transcribed together under the control of a single promoter, which means the operon technically the operons are mostly been present in the polycystronic um, transcriptional unit and they are going to be present in the prokaryotes and the bacteriophage where you are going to have the group of structural genes or I will say the genes which is going to be transcribed for the different types of enzymes or the structural genes and they will be under the control of a single promoter. This means this single promoter is actually going to have the um, control over the synthesis of these structural genes. So, you are going to in a, in a typical operon you are going to have the oper, uh, promoter right next to the promoter you are going to have the operator and the op, next to the operator you are going to have this is this is going to be the coding region right. So, this is going to be the coding region and this coding region is going to be uh, responsible for so, this is the coding region and then you are going to have the poly A site right. So, the coding region is going to be responsible for the synthesis of the A protein, B protein and the C protein. So, generally operons are very common in prokaryotes and the bacteriophage, but it is also found in some eukaryotes. The main difference is that the expression of prokaryotic operon leads to the polycystronic messenger RNA whereas, the eukaryotic operons leads to the monocystronic messenger RNAs. 
In this particular lecture, we are mostly being focused on to the operon what is being present in the prokaryotic system. We have not discussed about the operons in the present in the uh, eukaryotic system. So, uh, the idea is that you should we should be able to tell you the concept of the transcriptional activations and transcriptional regulations and uh, uh, how the, the things are being done uh, similar kind of things are also being done in the eukaryotic system. So, prokaryotes are the single cell organisms lacking a true nucleus and the membrane bound organelles. It adopt the operant system as a mechanism to efficiently regulate the gene expression in response to the changing environment conditions. Uh, environment condition means the requirements of the different types of metabolites. Uh, availability of glucose, availability of oxygen and so on. So, the bacteria is since, since bacteria is a single cell organisms, it actually gets affected very often only and it is actually has to respond to these changes. The uh, operon system is a genetic regulatory system found in the prokaryotic organism that allowed the multiple gene with the related function to be controlled as a single unit. The system offers different advantage for prokaryotes like it is energy efficient right because you are supposed to only synthesize the operator or the repressor and that actually is good enough to control and regulate the active transcriptional activity of several genes. So, operon system allows them to coordinate the expression of multiple gene involved in a common pathway and transcribe together as single messenger RNA saving the energy and resources by producing the necessary protein only when required. Uh, then it is actually going to have a rapid response to the environmental changes. So, the opera, operon system enable them to adopt to the changing conditions quickly. If condition change, the expression of the relevant gene can be turned on or off rapidly. It is simple and compact right. So, prokaryotes can use a single regulatory region to control the expression of multiple genes. This is particularly advantageous in a organism with a small genome where saving space is very very crucial. So, if you require a multiple genes as a regulatory genes and so on you are actually going to increase the size of the genome and that the bacterial system cannot afford because bacterial system has to conserve the energy conserve the space and all those kind of things and that is why it is important that it should actually operate and control the multiple genes with the help of the operons. Then it has the coordinated regulations, it allows the bacteria to go with the coordinated regulation because it can regulate these 3 genes, 4 genes, 5 genes which are actually being present in the single pathway. For example, if you are talking about the glycolysis, you are going to regulate the hexokinase, you are going to regulate the pyruvate kinase and, and so on. So, since the all these genes are present in a single operon, probably it is easy for the bacteria to manage all these and on the other hand it is also going to save the energy. So, there will be a coordinated regulation. So, this coordinated regulation ensure that the product of genes, genes are produced in the appropriate stoichiometric ratio which means if you are processing the single glucose molecule, you require one glucose molecule of hexokinase, you require the one glucose uh, molecule of aldolase and so on. So, you can actually be able to produce these proteins and enzymes in a right proportion so that you should not waste the energy by producing some one or other in an excess amount and on the other hand you should not have the uh, lower production of any of these proteins. Then you have the resource allocations when a particular nutrient is available the genes required for the utilization are switched on once the nutrient becomes scarce the operation operate operon can be turned off preventing the wasteful production of the unnecessarily proteins. Then we have the adaptation to the niche uh, environment. So, the operon system enable the prokaryotes to adopt in a specialized niche by turning fine tuning the expression of genes that are specifically relevant to those conditions. So, this is also very very important that you are actually having a very very fine and uh, regulated uh, balance and that is how you can be able to have the uh, fine tuning of the expression of the genes that are relevant that particular for that particular uh, environmental conditions. Then you have the evolutionary advantage organisms with ability to regulate gene expression rapidly and efficiently in response to the environmental changes were more likely to survive and reproduce. 
So, uh, Operon as I said you know is been proposed uh, by the Jacob and Monet and it has been uh, in, in a control mechanisms through which the prokaryotic, through the prokaryotic system is uh, controlling the different types of gene and gene expressions within the bacteria. So, uh, in 1965 the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine was awarded jointly to the Jacobs, Monet, uh, Jacobs and Monet for discovery concerning the operon and the viral synthesis. So, this is the all scientists who have got the Nobel Prize in Medicine in the 1965 for their concept of the operon. So, before we get into the detail of the operons and how uh, and we are going to take up some of the examples of the operon, it is important to understand what will be the structure of general structure of an operon. So, this is just a general structure of the operon right you are going in the general structure what you are going to have right. So, this is the transcriptional unit right this is the transcriptional unit where you are going to have the promoters you are going to have the operators, you are going to have the structural genes. For example, in this case this is a structural gene for A, B and C and apart from that you are also going to have the uh, regulatory genes. So, regulatory genes are actually going to be a part of uh, is going to produce the regulatory proteins uh, and is going to produce the regulatory proteins and these regulatory proteins could be uh, activators right or it could be repressor and uh, condition of the activator and repressor will go and bind to the operator right and and so this region what you see here is actually a part of operon so regulatory gene is not going to be a part of operon and regulatory proteins are going to either activate or either going to facilitate the binding of RNA polymerase or it is actually going to have the uh, other way around right. So, regulatory gene encodes for a protein called regulatory protein which either act as a repressor or activator which controls the operon, but it is not a part of operon because it has its own promoter right. So, regulatory genes are not a part of operon, this is the part of operon where you are going to have the promoters, operators and the genes for the structural genes. Now, let us talk about the regulation of an operon. So, there are two types of transcriptional regulation which is going to be possible in the operon, one is called as the first is called as the negative uh, control and the second is called as the positive control. So, then the negative control in which the regulatory protein is act as a repressor which binding to the DNA and inhibiting the transcriptional of the protein right. So, uh, and then you have a positive control in which the regulatory protein is acting as an activator which is stimulate for the transcription. So, this is the regulatory gene from which you are going to have the regulatory proteins and regulatory proteins could either be a repressor which means once it goes and bind to the operator it will not allow the RNA polymerase to go and bind to the promoter and that is how it is actually not going to allow the transcription of. So, there will be no transcription of the structural genes this is going to be called as the negative control. Whereas, in the case of positive control you are going to have the uh, regulatory proteins which are actually go and bind to the operators and that is how they are actually going to facilitate the efficient binding of the RNA polymerase to the uh, promoters and that is how it is actually going to have the more production of the this particular structural genes and these are called as the positive regulations. This means when you have this you are going to have the more production when you have this and you have going to have the lower production this means it is going to be negative regulation this is going to be a positive regulations. Within this you are going to have the uh, two different types of com conditions either it is going to be uh, inducible or it is going to be repressible. Then you are going to have uh, so, operon can also be either inducible or repressible. So, inducible operons are those in which the transcription is normally been off which is not going to take place 
and it needs inducer to induce the transcription which means it is going to be trans uh, it is going to be turned on repressible operons are those in which the transcription is normally been on which means the, there will be a basal level of transcription which is going to take place sometime it may happen to repress the transcription or turn it off so you are going to have the positive control negative control and then you can also have the inducible operon or the repressible or in, uh, operon so this is what i have summarized here so you are going to have the negative uh, uh, control you are going to have positive control and within the negative control or the positive control you can be having the inducible operon or the repressible operon so uh, in the negative control the product of the regulatory gene inhibits the transcription in the positive control the product of regulatory gene is going to activate the transcription whereas in the inducible operon your initial condition or the, i will say the basal level of transcription is going to be off which means you are not going to have the transcription of that particular gene but once this inducible uh, inducer is present then you are going to have the uh, operon which is going to work so it's going to have the uh, turn on the transcription whereas in the case of repressible uh, initial condition the basal level there will be a transcription but when the irrepressible is present there will it is actually going to turn off the transcription so let's first discuss about the negative in negative inducible operon so within the negative you can have the inducible you can actually having the so you're going to have the inducible or you're going to have the repressible uh, even within the positive control also you can have the inducible or the repressible so there are several different conditions in which all uh, this has to be understood right so let's first take the first example that is the negative control inducible so in a negative so negative inducible operon in a negative inducible operon the regulatory gene encode a repressor which readily binds to the operator as operator side overlap with the promoter side so that the binding of the repressor physically block the binding of RNA polymerase on the promoter and prevent the transcription. So, uh, for the initiation of transcription something is needed to prevent the binding of the repressor at the operation site and represent the operator's site of binding that is the inducer. This type of system is said to be inducible since transcription is usually off and must be turned on. So, in this negative inducible operon what will happen is that you are going to from the regulator you are going to have the repressor right so this is the repressor molecule which will go and fit and sit onto the operator so since the repressible is uh, sitting on the uh, so uh, if if the new if the no inducer is present this uh, uh, this uh, repress repressor will be keep binding to the operator molecule and it will not allow the uh, transcription of the structural gene because repressively bind the operator and it will inhibit the transcription so there will be a transcriptional off right and uh, when the inducer is present what will happen is that the inducer is uh, suppose the uh, insulin for example right or i will say glucose right if the glucose is present what will happen is that the glucose will go and bind to this repressor right and in that case it is actually going to make the active repressor to a uh, inactive repressor and then the act in a inactive repressor would not be able to bind the operator and as a result it is actually going to allow the transcription of these particular structural genes so this is a example of or the mechanism in which the negative inducible operon is going to operate uh, we are going to take the few examples and then you will be able to understand this more nicely and then we have the second condition second condition is that you are going to have the negative repressible operon right so the regulator gene in this type of operon synthesizes and the inactive operon that cannot bind to the operator so rna polymerase readily bind to the promoter without any inhibition and transcribe the structural genes to turn the uh, to turn the transcription uh, something must be needed to make the repressor active a small molecule called a co-repressor binds to the repressor and make it capable of binding to the operator so in the absence of inducer 
regulatory genes are producing the repressor, but these repressors are inactive, which means they will not be able to bind the operator and that is why there will be a transcription. So, transcription is on, right? So, transcription is on, uh, sorry, transcription is on, right? under the bacillus level because your RNA polymerase will go and bind to the promoter there is no inhibition because the repressor what you are producing is inactive and that is how there will be a production of on right. So, there will be a transcription on when the inducer is present the inducer will go and bind to the repressor and that is how it is going to convert the inactive repressor to into a active repressor and active repressor will go and bind to the promoter and that is how it is actually going to inhibit the transcription and that is how it is actually going to have the turn off, it is going to turn off the transcription. So, this is the another example or another way in which the uh, operon can be, uh, can be regulated. So, this is called as negative repressible operon. Then the third condition is the positive inducible response, right. Remember that in the positive it is going to be transcriptionally off and then it is going to be on when the inducer is present. So, in a positive inducer uh, inducible operon transcription is usually turned off because the regulatory proteins that is the activator is produced in an inactive form, right. Remember that when you are talking about the positive regulation, it is going to be inducer, it is going to be activator rather than repressor. So, the negative control it is going to be done by the repressor, whereas here it is going to be activator. So, whatever we have discussed in the case of negative uh, operons, it is going to be exactly the reverse. So, in this case, the activator is produced, but that activator is in the inactive means it cannot activate the transcription, right. So, uh, transcription take place when an inducer has become attached to the regulatory protein rendering to the regulatory side. So, when the inducer is not present, the regulatory region is producing an activator, but this is an inactive regulator which means it requires some kind of modification so that it will go and bind to the operator and that is how it actually can enhance the production or enhance the transcription. So, there will be a transcriptional off right because the uh, this activator is not competent enough or efficient enough to induce the transcription. So, uh, inactive activators cannot activate the transcription and that is why there will be no transcription. But once the you add the inducers, these inducer will go and bind to the activators and once the activate, uh, activator bind to the inducers, they will actually going to have there could be a structural changes within the activator and that is how they will be actually go and bind to the operator, right. And the active operator stimulate the transcription, right. And that is how you are going to have the transcription with of the structural genes. Then we have the positive repressible operon. This is exactly the opposite of the uh, negative uh, inducible operon. Okay. So, a positive operon can also be repressible, the regulatory protein is producing an activator and that will bind to the DNA meaning the transcription usually take place and has to be repressed. Transcription is inhibited when a substance become attached to the activator and render it unable to bind the DNA. So, transcription is no longer stimulated. So, this is exactly the, in the in the case of no inducer you are going to have the active uh, active activators and active activator will go and bind the operator and that is why there will be enhanced production of the these particular genes. But when the inducer will be in added inducer will go and bind to the transcription making them uh, inactive transcription uh, activator an inactive activator will actually going to turn off the transcription. So, these are the four different conditions in which the operon can be uh, regulated by the uh, activator or the repressor proteins and it could be inducible or it could be repressible. So, these are the just the, uh, the summary of what we have discussed so far. So, uh, you going to have the repressible operon or you are going to have the inducible operon. The repressible operon generally in normally keep the uh, synthesis on, but can be turned off by the repressors. Whereas, in the inducible operon generally the genes are TOF, 
medulla means the transcription is off but can be turned on by the inducer repressible operon are mostly been present in the anabolism reactions or anabolic reactions whereas the inducible operons are always been present in the uh, catabolic reactions uh, in repressible operons you are going to have the inactive form whereas in the inducible operon you are going to have the active forms and the examples of the repressible operon is the tryptophan operon whereas inducible operon it is the example of the lac operon so we are going to take up the uh, these examples so that it will be easy for you to understand what is mean by the inducible operon what is mean by the repressible operon and so on so let's take an first example that is the uh, lac operon and then we are going to take the tryptophan operon so this is the uh, example where you are going to have the synthesis whereas here you are going to have the breakdown of the substance so this is going to be related to the catabolic reactions and this is actually going to be related to the anabolic reactions so let's first start with the uh, lac operons so lac operon or the lactose operon which is uh, in short it's called as lac operon so the lac operon of the e coli contains the gene which are involved into the lactose metabolism it is expressed only when the lactose is present and the glucose is absent this is very important okay if you have a glucose then the lac operon will no longer be active lactose can be broken down by the e coli but it is not their preferred energy source they would much uh, instead use glucose if it is available lactose can be broken down more slowly and with less energy than glucose however if lactose is the only sugar present e coli will immediately use it as a fuel the lac lac operon contains the three structural genes lac z lac y and lac a okay so these are the three genes lac z lac y and lac a and all these three genes have their own uh, uh, individual roles so lac z is called as the beta galactosidase lac y is called as beta galactosidase permease and lac a is actually been called as beta galactosidase transacetylase these genes are transcribed as single messenger rna under the control of the single promoter that is the this promoter the lac operon is typically been present as a shut off okay or repressed in a normal conditions but can be activated in the presence of the inducer which is called as lactose or allo lactose thus the lac operon referred to be an inducible operon so allo lactose is a structural analog of the lactose okay so you these are the structural genes regulatory genes and the regulatory uh, regulatory dna sequences and the regulatory gene which are present in the lac operons so you are going to have the three different types of structural genes lac z which codes for the enzyme beta galactosidase the cleaves galactose into the glucose and galactose this enzyme also converts the lactose into allo lactose then we have the lac y which encodes for the beta galactosidase permease which transport the lactose into the cell so basically the lac y is so this is if this is the cell the lac y is actually going to bring the lactose into the cell okay and then lactose is going to be get converted into glucose and galactose right uh, by the enzyme which is called as uh, lac by the gene product of lac z right so it's going to be called as beta galactosidase and lac a codes for the enzyme which is called as beta galactosidase transacetylase it is not essential for the lactose metabolism but appears to be play a role in the detoxification of the compound by transferring and the acetyl group then we have the regulatory dna sequences remember that in a transcriptional unit you have the promoters you're going to have the uh, you're going to have the coding region and then you're going to have the three prime polyethyl right apart from this you are also going to have the because we are talking about the operons so in this case you are going to have the operators so you are going to have the promoters followed by operators followed by structural genes followed by the 
polyatal, right? So, the regulatory DNA sequences you are going to have the promoters. So, the promoter is the binding site for the RNA polymerase which initiated the transcription of the structural gene. LAC promoter is a weak promoter. So, remember that when we were talking about the transcription, we discuss about the weak and a strong promoter. So, there are uh, compositions which actually in, uh, becomes the which makes the promoter as a weak promoter or the uh, uh, or the strong promoters, right? Because a strong promoters um, uh, allows the efficient uh, uh, efficient transcription of the DNA, right? And it allows the efficient, very efficiently, the RNA polymerase to go and bind the and complete the transcription. Whereas in the case of weak promoters, the uh, the melting of the DNA or the other kinds of activities is very difficult and that is how it is actually going to have the uh, lower efficiency and lower production of the RNAs. Apart from that you are going so going to have the operators. So, the operator is a negative regulatory site bound with the lac repressor protein. The operator overlap with the promoters. Then we have the cap binding site. The cap binding site is a positive regulatory site that is bound by the catabolite uh, activator protein or the cap. When the cap is bound to this site, it promotes the transcription by helping the RNA polymerase bind to the promoter. Apart from that, you are also going to have the regulatory genes which is called as lac I. So, the regulatory gene lac I transcribed and produced the lac repressor protein and inhibited the lac repressor transcription. In order to accomplish this, it binds to the promoter partially overlapping the prom operator. When bound, the lac repressor gets into the way of RNA polymerase and prevents the opera uh, operon transcription. But when the lac repressor binds with the lactote, it becomes the repressed. So, there are multiple conditions, right? So, you are going to have the uh, in the absence of, so just to make it comparable what we have discussed. So, in absence of inducers, so in absence of inducers, so lack, remember that lac operon is, uh, is lactose is going to be an inducer. So, in absence of inducer, so in absence of inducer or in presence of inducer. So, when the lactose is not available, which means the inducer is not available, the lac repressor strongly bind with the operator and stop the RNA polymerase from the initiation of transcription. However, the lac repressor loses its capability to bind DNA when the lactose is present. It leaves the operator and float away, making it possible for RNA polymerase to transcribe the gene. So, if the lac uh, lactose is not present, right? then the what will happen is that the repressor will not be able to bind the operator ok. Uh, and uh, so, if the lactose is not available right, the repressor will go and bind to the operator and since the repressor is binding to the operator, it will not allow the RNA polymerase to go further to start the transcription. So, there will be no transcription of the structural gene of lac Z, Y and Z. And when the allo lactose is absent, the repressor binds with the operator. So, the transcription cannot initiate by the RNA polymerase without any preventions. Now, when the lactose or the allo lactose is available, so what will happen is these inducer will go and bind to the repressor, right. So, when they will go and bind to the repressor, allo lactose or the lactose, uh, it will they, they will no longer be able to bind the operator and as a result what will happen is that the RNA polymerase will move and it will actually going to do the synthesis of the structural genes and that is how they are actually going to produce the uh, beta lactosidase and other kinds of enzyme from these genes. So, when the allo lactose bind with the lac repressors, the repressor cannot bind an operator. So, transcription initiation by RNA polymerase without any preventions. So, some of the lact apart from the lactose or the allo lactose, some of the allo lactose analogs can also be used for the uh, for the lac promoters or the lac uh, operons. One of the very popular uh, lactose uh, analog is the IPTG or isopropyl beta D1 thiogalactosidase. It is actually an inducer for the protein production. And uh, that we are anyway going to discuss when we are going to discuss about the molecular cloning. 
then we have the phenyl beta d galactose which is called as phenyl galactose and then you also have thiomethyl galactose or the TMG. So, all these are some of the lactose analog. So, either the lactose, allolactose or these analogs can be able to modulate the activity of the uh, repressor and that is how they can actually be able to have the uh, effect on the uh, uh, into the lactose operon. Then the lac promoter is a weak promoter. It does not bind the RNA polymerase more efficiently on its own. It would not be able to accomplish much more without the help of the catabolite activator protein. High transcriptional levels are facilitated by the caps binding to a stretch of DNA right before the lac operon. Right? So, this is the cap binding region and this is the cap proteins and cap proteins are actually going to bind by the cyclic AMP. So, E. coli produces the cyclic uh, AMP as a hunger signal in the low glucose conditions by attaching to the cap cyclic AMP modifies the structure of the cap enabling it to bind the DNA and stimulate the transcription. Cap is inactive without cyclic AMP only when the glucose levels are low the cyclic AMP levels are very high does camp actually activate. So, in the condition of low glucose when the low when the when the when the condition is low glucose you are going to have the large quantity of the ADP and ADP is going to be get converted into AMP and this AMP is actually going to be get converted into cyclic AMP and the cyclic AMP will go and bind to the cap cap region right so it's actually going to bind the cap proteins and uh, once they bind to the cap protein they are actually going to uh, you know, uh, they are actually going to uh, block the activity. So, when the cap attached to the cap, uh, cyclic AMP attached to the cap and activate it, allowing it to bind the DNA, cap helps the RNA polymerase to bind to the promoter, resulting in a high level of transcription, right. So, uh, in, the, in, a, in a state of starvation, you are going to have a very high uh, amount of ADP and that ADP is getting converted into AMP and then the AMP is getting converted into cyclic AMP and in the case of low glucose this cyclic AMP will go and bind to the cap and as a result it actually going to activate and allowing it to bind the DNA and cap is actually going to help the promoter to bind the to the bind to the promoter and that is how they are actually going to have the high level of transcription of these genes. When there will be a high glucose, so in the case of high glucose there will be no production of cyclic AMP and that is how there will be no binding of cyclic AMP to the cap and as a result the cap will not going to help the RNA polymerase to bind to the promoter and that is why there will be a low level of transcription. So, there will be high amount of lacoperon transcription are only possible without glucose. This method ensure that the bacteria only activate the lacoperon and begin using the lactose after exhausting their primary energy source that is the glucose. So, if the glucose is present it is actually going to block or it is going to inhibit the lac operon activity simply because it is actually going to uh, does not allow the production of cyclic AMP and cyclic AMP is going to bind the cap region or the cap proteins and that is how they are actually going to facilitate the binding of RNA polymerase to the promoter. So, uh, if we summarize all these conditions, what is the conditions you are going to have the glucose absent, lactose absent, right. So, there will be no transcription, right. So, there are going to be four conditions. In four conditions, you are going to have in first condition, you are going to have the glucose absent, lactose absent. In those conditions, there will be no transcription of the RNA uh, the lac operon or there will be no lac operon activity because the lac operon inducer is also absent and the glucose is also absent. So, there is still there although there will be a production of cyclic AMP because the glucose is absent, but since the lactose is also uh, absent the repressor protein will actually going to repressor repress the activity or repress the uh, production of uh, the production of RNA from the RNA uh, from the RNA polymerase. Now, the there will be a second condition. So, second condition would be that the glucose is absent, 
but the lactose is present right in that condition there will be a high transcription right because the in the absence of glucose we discussed already right that the, from the adp it is actually going to form the amp and from the amp it is actually going to form the cyclic amp and the cyclic amp will go into the cap and it will go and bind to the cap region of the dna and that's how it is actually going to facilitate the promoter and since the lactose is present lactose will also going to bind the repressor and that's how it is actually going to remove the repression and as a result uh, it is actually going to have the uh, allow the rna polymerase to go for the transcription and that's why there will be a high transcription level now the third condition is that you are going to have the uh, glucose present and lactose absent right so if the glucose is present uh, it is actually not going to allow the production of cyclic amp and there will be a low level of cyclic amp so that the cap will not going cap proteins will not be able to bind to the cap region and that's how the rna polymerase will not be efficiently be able to bind to the promoter and that's how and on the other hand since the lactose is absent the repressor will actually going to bind and uh, it's going to uh, uh, you know allow the uh, op uh, operator right so it's going to allow the repressor to bind to the operator and that's why there will be no transcription in the fourth condition fourth condition both the biomolecule both the molecules are present which means the glucose is also present and lactose is also present in that case there will be a low level of transcription because since the lactose is so uh, if the glucose is present there will be no cyclic amp so it's not going to efficiently allow the binding of the cap proteins to the cap region of the dna and that's how there will be a very low level of transcriptional activity from the rna polymerase because the lactose is present it will actually going to bind the repressor and that's how it is actually going to destroy the inhibition of the operator and that's how it's going to allow the rna polymerase to go but this level of rna uh, transcription would be less compared to the transcription uh, activity what we have just observed in the condition number 2 so uh, if we summarize all these activities uh, uh, summary would be that the lac operon contains the gene those are involved into the lactose metabolisms lac operon is a negative inducible operon the genes are expressed only when the lactose is present and the glucose is absent remember this is very important because the glucose is the primary metabolite and or primary metabolite preferred by the cell whereas the lactose is the secondary metabolite and it is not being preferred by the cell so it will not going to utilize the lactose until the glucose is absent and we have already discussed that when the glucose is absent it is going to have the synthesis of the cyclic amp and the cyclic amp will go and bind to the cap proteins and that's how the cap protein is actually going to help into the binding of rna polymerase to the promoter site and that's how it is actually going to have the higher production of the uh, uh, protein synthesis the operon is turned off in a normal conditions the operon is turned on and turned off depending upon the glucose and lactose level the catabolic activator protein and the lac repressor off the lac repressor blocks the transcription of the operon by binding with the operator in the absence of, in the presence of lactose it stops acting as a repressor so catabolite activator protein act as an enhancer activate the transcription of the operon but only when the glucose levels are low so these are the four conditions what we have already discussed if we have the glucose we have the no lactose then there will be no transcription right because the glucose is present and it is going to inhibit the activity of the cyclic production of cyclic amp then you can have the both the glucose and lactose present then it will be having the low level of transcription then you third condition where the glucose is also absent and lactose is also absent then there will be no transcription and then the fourth condition is that the glucose is absent but the lactose is present so in that case there will be a production of cyclic amp and the cyclic amp will allow the binding of the uh, cap proteins to the cap region of cap region and that's how it is actually going to uh, facilitate the binding of the RNA polymerase to the promoter and that's why there will be a high level of transcription and because the lactose is also present it will actually going to block the repressor 
and lacai right and that's how it is actually going to have the high level of uh, transcription so this is the summary of the lac operon so with this i would like to conclude my lecture here in a subsequent lecture we are going to discuss some more aspects related to molecular biology thank you mm -hmm.